Welcome to the Content Amplified Podcast, brought to you by Masset. Our goal is to help you get more from your marketing content. Each episode is a 10 to 15 minute interview with industry experts that share amazing insights to help you squeeze as much juice from your content as you possibly can. Here's today's interview. Welcome back to another episode of Content Amplified. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Well, Sarah, when we were talking earlier, and you'll hear this from her background, is way smarter than me. So like, this is one to pay attention to. Just by the education alone, you can tell that she knows way more than I do about a lot of things. Um, but Sarah, before we dive in, um, I think it would be really helpful. Maybe share a few things about your background, uh, your education, your passions in marketing to kind of set the stage, because I think it's really relevant to the subject for today in our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, have to do the legal thing at the beginning and just say, um, you know, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of my own and they do not represent the views or positions of the company that I work for. Um, And the content of this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. So just got to- So that that is like the greatest hint about the direction we're going at. (laughs) So like, I think that's awesome. And we've all been there. Yeah. Definitely. So I love it. So yeah, I'd love to hear, let's, let's hear a little bit more about your background and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I went to Texas A&M and graduated with a bachelor's of science in biology and a minor in neuroscience. Um, I worked in a neuroscience lab for about four years um, researching exosomes, which is actually a pretty new uh, topic as far as um, biology goes. Um So that was fantastic. And then I ended up going to Wake Forest for, um, I started out in the health disparities in neuroscience related disorders master's program and finished up with a biomedical uh, sciences master's degree. And while I was working um, for a company there, they uh, had a sales and marketing position. It was a science company. And I said, you know, okay, sure. I'll take whatever position is available. And I got really interested in the application of neuroscience and just the way people make decisions to marketing in general. Um, So I started reading a lot about behavioral economics and um, just got really interested in marketing through that lens. I love it. So your education sounds way cooler than mine. Like (laughs) I have a bachelor's in marketing and you had a lot of other cool things to say. So I'm fascinated about this. So what's what's today's subject and what we're going to talk about that's super interesting is how to market when you have a really technical or very regulated industry that you're operating in. Um, It's not the easiest thing to do. And honestly, if my experience and Sarah's experience is anything, you might find yourself at one of these businesses now or at some point in time down the future. And I think as time goes on, the likelihood of you working at one of these kinds of businesses is going to be high. Um, cause these are things that can't easily be replicated, um, through technology and things of that nature. And honestly, as technology gets greater, like more of these kinds of businesses are going to pop up and they're going to be really fun, cutting edge. It, it's really cool. So we'll kind of dive into that. So first question for you, Sarah, when you're trying to work in these markets, how do you work on creating content in the first place? What are some of the steps you take to come up with your ideas and make sure that they're sound, that they're actually accurate, that they're actually like something you're allowed to say? Maybe start walking through like, what's your typical process for creating content in a really highly regulated or technical space? Sure. So um, I think, you know, the way that I position myself, at least in like, you know, when I was looking for a job and those sorts of things is, um, you know, I have a fundamental understanding of the science background. And so I think first of all, taking a look at who you're marketing to and what their pain points are. And I know that's, you know, a pretty fair first step for any, um, industry, but especially in biotech, you're looking at really specific problems on really specific instruments, really specific assays, um, I mean, you're segmenting down to, um, you know, like molecular and then what type of molecular and then, you know, what sort of like um, 
lab equipment they have, uh, what sort of reagent access they have. And so there's a lot of factors that go into planning this content. Um, but I would say, I mean, I start by talking to R&D. I, talk, I start by talking to our subject matter experts, our product managers who know the market, and then our um, regulatory department to make sure that whatever claims we're making are, you know, regulatorily, I don't know if it's a word, <laughs> above board, um, and making sure that they actually address you know, what these pain points are for these very specific technical people in the labs. Um, so having worked in a lab, I feel like I have a really good understanding of what people actually care about. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to look at a lab from the outside in and actually understand what would move the needle for these people or what would actually like make their workload less or what would actually, you know, help with data analysis or those sorts of things. So I feel like having that fundamental understanding is a really great place to start. And then talking to the subject matter experts and the market experts, um, it's a very collaborative process. Um, and we also, you know, talk to our commercial team about what their actual, you know, revenue goals are, what products they're interested in, you know, selling more of, selling less of, um, where we need to move things around. And then I think also, you know, being plugged into what's happening um, as far as like regulatory changes go, um, things change constantly. And so having a good pulse on what's going on so that you can do proactive marketing instead of reactive marketing is really crucial. Yeah, I love that last point. So, you know, we in an earlier episode, we talked about the difference between evergreen content and timely content. And in highly technical or highly regulated businesses, like you mentioned, like there are new regulations all the time that allow you to really tap into the power of timely content. How do you typically stay on top of that? And maybe how have you taken advantage of that to really get in front of the right people at the right time with your content? Yeah. So I think a great example of this is that my my last position, I, I worked um, part for an IRB. Um, so it was really important to a lot of our customers that we were a nonprofit IRB. And for those of you who maybe don't know what an IRB is, it's basically the regulatory board that reviews clinical trials to make sure that they are ethical. So making sure that we conveyed that our differentiator was that we were a nonprofit, we had no interest in you know returning profit to stakeholders. Um, I think that was a really impactful and timely, uh, we wrote a white paper about it and published it on uh, LinkedIn and sent us, you know, a lot of targeted emails to people who we knew were customers of the competitor that was being acquired by a venture capital backed firm. Um, and we were really able to drive that, you know, point home of like, we are first and foremost concerned about the ethics of your clinical trial. And I think that was a huge, um, a huge differentiator in that space because, you know, when you work for a company that is either doing a clinical trial or, um, you know, involved on the regulatory side, like that is the foundation of your clinical trial. Like if it is deemed to be, you know, unethical or, you know, something went wrong at the beginning, like pretty much everything ends up invalidated. And so you want to make sure that you're doing that right from the beginning and that there's no questions when you get to, you know, stage four or, um, you know, you actually put a drug out. And so that's really important to people who are spending millions and millions of dollars to, you know, bring these drugs to market. I love that. And I love the, the concrete example. Um, you know, just like anything inside of a market, when there's a new change, the search volume, the interest, the research all skyrocket for a short amount of time, sometimes longer than others. Mm -hmm. And if you can capture that mind share, for that uh, time period, that's awesome. And any kind of content you create will inherently just have more eyeballs and more power. And then also just imagine your sales reps and the people that are actually pushing your product to have that kind of material to say, hey, by the way, have you heard about this new regulation? Hey, we have some great material that you can do some research on. And then you're doing them a favor. Like there's, there's a lot of really good values about staying on top of that. Yeah, so, so I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, dive in, yeah, go ahead. No, I was, so I think that like you start with, you know, a content calendar, you start with your objectives that you have from your, you know, corporate leadership or whatever. Um, you start by building out a, a calendar for how you're going to achieve those goals with your paid and organic uh, marketing. 
And then you sort of have to leave room for events like that to happen um, where, you know, you're able to be dynamic and, and slot those things in and you're not so rigid in your plan. Uh, like it's important, obviously, to have a plan, but it's also important to be flexible and be able to, like you're saying, capture that interest uh, when the time is right. Absolutely. So shifting gears just a little bit, when you're in, in a business like this and your content inherently just has to go through an approval committee, whether it be mm-hmm. legal or R&D or compliance or whatever it may be, how do you build good relationships with these groups? Um, so the, the communication as you're trying to create content is really healthy, that you're getting positive feedback instead of just no's. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's, hey, here's how we can work together to make this happen. How have you approached building those relationships um, in the businesses that you've worked for? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just fostering an environment of transparency and collaboration and um, coming to things humbly. Um, You know, there are so many things that our regulatory department and our research and development department know that I will just never be an expert in. Um, So coming to it with a little bit of humility and just asking questions. Um, And when you do get a flat no, you know, taking that extra step uh, and saying, you know, okay, well, what if we said it this way? Would it be okay then? Or, you know, is it this word that you're getting hung up on? Is maybe a disclaimer the way to go? Um, Just making sure you're collaborating with them and working on um, getting the messaging out there that you need to make a commercial difference while still being, you know, compliant. Um, and I think regulatory, you know, understands that as well. I mean, they, you know, of course have a duty to make sure that everything is above board, but they know that, you know, my job as a marketer is obviously to make sure that these claims are conveyed to our, you know, who we're selling to. So I think, I think the organization is also, um, fosters a pretty collaborative environment because we're all working towards the same goal. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to build those relationships and have that open communication, um, just for learning, if anything, if, if, I mean, if nothing else. Yeah. So you talked about like a content calendar, and this is something I experienced in my career. Um, when you're working in this space, how much padding do you put into that calendar for the time that it's going to take to go through the approval process to make sure that you're not always rushed towards the end and kind of anxious because you're trying to hit your deadlines? How do you pad that? Do you have like a, a standard amount of time or how do you typically try to account for that uh, extra step in the process? Yeah. So normally we know, um, especially if it's like a paid ad and we have like, you know, a vendor due date, we'll pretty much work backwards from that vendor due date. And I usually bake in about a week for them to review. Um, there have been many instances where I've needed expedited review. And again, that speaks to the building of relationships and respecting other people's time and having that Um, ability to say, hey, so sorry about this. This came up. Like, can you review this? Um, But generally a week, I would say, unless it's something, you know, super, super complex, like maybe a white paper might take a little bit longer. Um, But yeah, generally a week, we have something called a copy review process um, that we, we have like a whole matrix of who needs to review what, if it's like scientific content versus something like a press release versus an ad. Um, so just following that matrix that we have created over years now um, and just making sure everyone is aligned, knows the deadline and has the capacity to do that. I love it. Awesome. So in these kinds of industries, um, and this is probably the last question because this goes by so fast. Um, the, the more technical or regulated you are, typically you are often working with bigger organizations and you're focusing on a specific person in that business. It may be one person of thousands. Mm -hmm. You've talked about how to target from the content perspective of like speaking their language, but from like an actual targeting element, how have you found success in really getting to that person and getting their eyeballs on your content um, so that they're actually consuming it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, again, my background coming from, you know, actual lab science and marketing to people in labs, um, you know, helps me understand what sort of publications or advertisements people actually pay attention to. 
But I think it's also cultivating the type of content you share on, let's say, LinkedIn. I think you really have to earn the right to sell to people with those, you know, advanced degrees who are experts in their field um, by providing value and sharing insights, you know, from our own R&D department. So like when we have posters or we have um, information that we think would be valuable to the people we're selling to, like we have to be willing to share that freely if we expect them to engage with us. And so it's really just earning that respect, earning that trust within um, the industry and making sure that we are, um, you know, authoritative, we are regulatory, compliant regulatory uh, wise, um, making sure that, you know, there's no question when they go to purchase something from us, which could be years down the road, that they've heard our name, they know that we're trustworthy and that we provide value in the space. Because a lot of these people are altruists, you know, they are wanting to make sure that whatever they're doing in their specific, you know, field is right for the patient, right for the, you know, lab, right for, you're going to get the best results, those sorts of things. And so, you know, there's a way to, of course, sell with those um, points, but you have to also provide the proof and you have to be engaged with, you know, patient groups or, you know, involved with um, different regulatory bodies and just building that trust. I, I love that's it. That's an important thing. So one thing that I have a question, because I'm always fascinated by this one as well, um, jargon. So yeah. there's obviously like fun acronyms and all sorts of stuff. How heavy do you do the specific jargon? So if I saw something from your company immediately, I'd be like, I have no idea what they're talking about. This clearly isn't for me. How often like, do you weigh out how technical you should be on that front to kind of get rid of the riffraff like someone like me and, and really focus on the audience? Yeah, well, I think in our case, um, you know, we're talking about such specific genes or such specific assays that we're marketing to such a specific subset of molecular diagnostic um, you know, labs or hospitals or groups, um, that a lot of time, if you don't use jargon it or acronyms, it would be out of place. And yeah. so I think a lot of times you have to realize that like, nobody is calling, you know, whatever it is by its full name, they're calling it, you know, X, Y, Z. And so making sure, you know, this again speaks to like speaking their language, um, knowing sort of how things are referred to in the lab, how people talk to each other in the lab, how people talk to their, uh, you know, the decision makers, because we have, you know, decision makers and buyers, but we also have influencers. Um, so like, you know, a, like a lab tech would influence what a lab purchase. So they're not exactly the decision maker, but, you know, how can we speak to them so that they're advocating for, you know, whatever change we're suggesting that this lab make. Um, so I think jargon plays a huge role. And it's, <laughs> you'll especially find that with um, regulatory bodies um, there, I mean, they are all acronyms and they're all um, very similar sounding. And so I think it was truly like learning to speak a different language uh, within this uh, industry once I, when I started. I love it. That's awesome. Okay. So if anyone wants to continue the conversation and talk to you and has a lot of fun acronyms that they want to share or whatever <laughs> it may be, highly technical jargon, What's the best way to connect with you online and continue the conversation? Yeah, if you have uh, some fun acronyms you want to share or anything <laughs> else, um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Sarah Eves, S-A-R-A-H-E-A-V-E-S. -E um, and I would love to connect with you there. Perfect. And we'll link to Sarah's profile in the show notes as well. Sarah, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Thank you for listening to the Content Amplified podcast. Please subscribe and leave us a review. And for additional ways to get more out of your content, visit our website at getmasset.com. That's getmasset.com. And tune in next time to the Content Amplified podcast.